Welcome back to Just Chat. And this is the segment we do on Thursday nights just for the fun of it. You choose the topic, I research it, and then we explore it a little. So, tonight we are going to take a look at surrogacy. I got a lot of requests for this. Are Megan and Harry using surrogates for the delivery of their babies? Now, I didn't want to get into this, uh, and the first couple of times I thought, mm, well, what am I going to find? Well, the thing is, when I finally actually did start looking at it, okay, Audie wants to say hi, say hi. Once I started looking at it, something that really troubled me started to emerge. People who are even asking the question are getting slammed in the media. And they're being called trolls and haters and racist and conspiracy theorists and whatnot. And in my universe, you don't get to shut down a conversation just because you don't like the question. So yeah, we're going to do it. So that little blast from the past was the intro that I did for the first video. In fact, it's the only other video I've done on the subject of surrogacy uh, with respect to Nutmeg and Ginger. Of course, I don't even need to say that. I haven't done any other videos on surrogacy, no matter who we may have been discussing. So, yes. That was two years ago. So before we go on, I want to just share with you the conclusions that I came to after, after the research, after evaluating the evidence that was available at that time. So here you go. So after looking at all of the evidence, I have to say, one, and this is the most important, I can really see why people are suspicious. Absolutely. Two, I don't think so, but it's still 60-40. 60%, I think she was just patting her tummy, which, by the way, I absolutely believe was happening. I think that's what explains the different sizes. Um, yeah, I think she was patting. I think that was just a Hollywood thing. I think that as a little Hollywood baby... It's just, you're not pregnant if it's not, if the cameras aren't picking up on it, you know? I think it's just that simple, that she wanted to look pregnant and over the top and just all the rest of that Hollywood stuff. So I would have to say, I'm 60% convinced that's what's going on. However, remember I said 60-40. The 40%, maybe maybe if they had the right surrogate if they were careful if they had a few people around them they could trust could they pull it off yeah yeah i was about 60 percent convinced that it was a legitimate pregnancy I was only about 40% won over by the pro-surrogacy faction, but I was virtually 100% convinced that Nutmeg was padding her belly, that the moon bump was in fact you know, a mail order moon bump, that what we were seeing was not reality. I still hadn't reached the tipping point on uh, this is not a legitimate pregnancy. Since then, of course, we have more information that's come to light. We have the information on 
the Netflix docudrama. We have the information from Tom Bauer's book, Revenge. And most tellingly, we have the information from the Sock Puppets memoir, Wham. And as I say, that is the most telling because that's where I'm primarily going to focus on when we start getting into it now, two years later. I think that is fair. When someone writes something, when they print it, when they publish it, when they say, this is my memoir and this is the truth. Well, we have every right to hold them to that tale they have put out there. They have said, this is the truth. We can judge. So, when we start looking at this, please remember, we've got three pregnancies we need to look at. Back in 2021, we were only looking at one pregnancy, just the discussion of the putative child Archie. Now we have also the putative child Lilibet and the alleged lost pregnancy in between. So I think it is perfectly reasonable to look at all three of those pregnancies. So I in looking at what was going on in terms of the first pregnancy, we were limited. We had newspaper accounts. There were problems with the information that was coming out. For example, this is in the video. Oh, by the way, I will either tell you what resources I am using. For example, the Sock Puppets book, the Netflix docudrama, Revenge by Tom Bauer, or if it's an article, I will put a link in the video notes. I want you to be able to see all of this for yourself. And frankly, if we had more time, I would be giving you direct quotes from the books, etc. But we don't have that kind of time. Sorry. All right. When we start looking at the first pregnancy, we didn't have Harold's melodramatic account, uh, as he related in Spare. And one of the things that is extremely interesting, suggestive, but not by any means proof, is that when he was relating his life story, he barely glossed over that first pregnancy uh, and the second pregnancy and the third pregnancy. There are none of the, the stories, the jokes, the, the cute, um, heartwarming, touching little anecdotes that expectant fathers have about what went on in the pregnancy, the time they reached over and touched their wife's belly and the baby turned suddenly and they jumped out of their skin when they got kicked. Nothing like that. Nothing. Uh, there is virtually no uh, connection between the sock puppet and what was allegedly going on in the pregnancy. No talk about what he thought when he saw the first sonogram, what he thought when he felt the baby kick for the first time. None of that. Not proof, but definitely suggestive because any expectant father is going to be able to share their own little stories, even if those stories are horrific. Like, she used to wake me up at 2 o'clock in the morning because she wanted clam chowder and sauerkraut. None, none of that. Nothing. What we have is on the first pregnancy, when he recounts from his own point of view, the time that his beloved wife is telling him she intends to snuff her own candle 
and take his baby with her. Zip. They go off to the Cirque du Soleil, and Harry recounts the party line, which is basically Nutmeg's version of events, that she just sobbed all the way through the performance so no one could see. Funny thing is, there are photos of them going into the theater, there are photos of them coming out of the theater, and there is nothing. There is no puffiness, there is no red eyes, there are no tear stains, nothing. So, I think we can all use our own judgment in terms of evaluating that incident. Nevertheless, he goes on, and this is new information we got in Spare, that ghastly fight he had with his brother when William broke his necklace and knocked him into the dog food bowl. I know it's hard to take this guy seriously when he's also claiming to be a rough and tumble soldier. So the first thing he does when he picks himself up out of the dog food bowl and says goodbye to William is he calls his therapist. Wonder why, if he's got his therapist on speed dial, he wasn't calling that therapist a few weeks earlier when his beloved wife was in crisis. Just saying. He then goes on to recount uh, the, the adventure in the hospital in great detail. Now, in Finding Freedom, we got information saying that Nutmeg had doctors visiting her every day as her due date approached. In the Sock Puppets version, the due date was approaching on April 29th. He was specific about the date. April 29th, the due date was approaching. And a week later, obviously, because we're looking at you know, May, May 5th or 6th at this point, they decided that to be on the safe side, they would go to the hospital. A decision that if the version in Finding Freedom was correct, would have been unnecessary because the doctors who were visiting her every day according to Finding Freedom, would have made that decision. They would not have had to decide this on their own and slink off to the hospital. Then, of course, once we're at the hospital, we have a, a story about the unattended canister of nitrous oxide, which the sock puppet just sucked down like it was so much free Halloween candy, crazy, but still, do I believe that if he had drugs available to him, he would have taken it? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, but do I believe that a canister of nitrous oxide was left unattended in a hospital room? Well, if that's the case, then whoever brought it in there and left it unattended was probably looking for a job the next day, because hospitals are not allowed to leave drugs open and available to anybody who walks in the room. That's just, this, this is not television. These are real hospitals. They have to account for medications. And these are real medical providers. They know that medications, when improperly used, can be very dangerous. That part of the story doesn't wash. Then we have the idea that nutmeg had labor uh, induced. Now remember, 29th, he says clearly, on the 29th of April, her due date was approaching, which means it wasn't there yet. We are talking about a date one week later. And we're not up to the due date but apparently the due date took place somewhere in there and they're already inducing labor. I would have to say that is questionable. 
it is not solid proof of a lie, but it's questionable. Ordinarily, labor is not induced until the mother is overdue at some point. And that's not by two days. Two days doesn't count as overdue. So it has to be like a week or so. And he's saying they induced labor. He's also saying that induced labor and water birth, which again is a little problematic, especially because she allegedly had two epidurals, not just one, which means she had a lot of drugs in her system. And then, remember, two epidurals, not just one. The baby is born and it appeared to the sock puppet that it was tangled and he was concerned about the baby not breathing or whatever. He was high on drugs. So I'm either dismissing his entire story out of hand as a complete fabrication, or if any part of it was accurate, and I would be inclined to believe that the drug part would be accurate, he was not in a state of mind to accurately process, so I don't have to pay too much attention to that. What I do have to pay attention to is two epidurals and released from the hospital an hour after the baby was born. And this was a geriatric mother and her allegedly first child. Ordinarily, and this is for the benefit of those of you who are not aware of this ordinarily, even today, women are kept in the hospital for at least six hours after a birth. If it's a first birth, if there were complications, such as two epidurals, or the whatever tangled mess the sock puppet was fabricating, any sort of complication, they're going to stay in longer. I would say that simply being a geriatric mother, two epidurals, was sufficient to warrant an extended hospital stay because they would want to wait until they were reasonably sure the drugs were out of her system and they were sending her home without medical care. Now, if they'd been sending her home with nurses, that might be a different story, but it's not the story the sock puppet is telling. So, is this likely? Now, here's where we're going to pull out of nutmeg and ginger and we're going to bring in Judge Judy. And Judge Judy says, if it doesn't make sense, that's because it's not true. And I put it to you, does this make sense? Everything else we've discussed, I think, more than adequately in the first video. So if you have questions about that, go back to the first video. I realize it is a long video. I think it ran about 40 minutes, but it is what it is. And a lot of the other issues were explored more carefully, including the reason why the issue of surrogacy is so important. And now while we're on that subject, I said something that showed a remarkable lack of foresight on my part. And let me share it with you. This is why it's important. Harry and Meghan are no longer royal highnesses. They're off living in California, doing their own thing here. Please take them back. But their children are part of the British royal family. And in time, if those children reconcile, with the rest of the family. They could be eligible for royal duties. They could be eligible for payments uh, through the civil list. So it's not just a, a moral right. It's, it's a financial right they would be able to tap into. And that's coming out of the pockets of the British taxpayers. The people have a right to be assured that their royal family, many of whom they are helping to support, are in fact who they are pretending to be. It's just that simple. So all of the people who say, well, it's none of your business are wrong. I mean, it's none of my business. I'm American. I'm never going to be 
called upon to support children that may or may not be legitimate? No. But you can. Yeah, I just said it right out. We're never going to be responsible for supporting these kids. Well, guess what? If Harry prevails in his suit to get the British government to issue IPP status to himself, the wife, and the putative children, oh yeah, we could end up picking up enhanced security costs for them for their entire lifetimes. I didn't see that one coming. I mean, obviously, I didn't see that one coming because I was very clear we would never be required to support British royal children. Well, I didn't think there would be any possibility we would be required to support Nutmeg and Ginger either. This is not what our government means when it, when it promulgated the laws that were intended to support people who cannot support themselves. No, that was not supposed to include enhanced security for the super rich. These programs were all designed to take care of at-risk children, single mothers without incomes. We are a generous country. We support people who need support. But the idea that we should be required to support the super rich. Whoa, I didn't see that one coming. So I'm going to walk away from this now because that was just the first of the three alleged pregnancies. Next up, we have the alleged miscarriage. Now, we have three separate and distinct stories about the miscarriage. But the first thing I want to get to, because I, I want to do this chronologically, is that this alleged miscarriage, which allegedly took place sometime in 2020, when we were all very conveniently in lockdown, that story actually begins in December of, uh, no, actually, I believe it's October of 2019. I have the article linked in the video notes. At that time, Nutmeg was suing the Mail on Sunday over that uh, Dear Daddy letter. And she had asked for a continuance, in other words, a delay in the trial, for nine months. And the reasons were sealed and declared to be confidential. Well, the time frame alone is very suggestive, so we can all infer what we want from that. Clock's ticking. We hit, like, October of 2020. Well, the ordinary course of events in nine months has not happened. So in November, Nutmeg publishes an op-ed piece in the New York Times about the trauma of her alleged miscarriage. That's one story. That story conflicts with the story the sock puppet told in Spare. Remember, in the op-ed piece, she was changing the baby, clutching her firstborn child to her breast, and humming him a lullaby while her secondborn was dying. Blah, 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 blah. In Spare, she collapsed with the sock puppet there. He was there, and he brought her to the hospital. In the Netflix docudrama, one of her friends alleged she collapsed at the front door. These three totally different stories. So where was she? At the front door with her friend, somewhere in the house with the sock puppet, or clutching the putative firstborn child? Three separate stories. You can't link those stories up in any way because the friend absolutely said front door. Nutmeg in the op-ed piece absolutely said the putative firstborn child's nursery. Two different places. And, of course, the sock puppet says he was there in his version. 
So, yeah. That, I think, well, three versions of any story means you don't have to believe any of them. And I don't. I, I do not believe any of these stories. Uh, just period. And also, another little tidbit. I'm not sure if the sock puppet even realized he put it in spare. But in the chapter in which he discusses when Nutmeg allegedly became pregnant with the second subsequently miscarried child, a few weeks later, actually I think it was a few days later, after she discovered she was pregnant, oh, and in typical Hollywood fashion, it was when they moved into, you know, that the Olive Garden in Montecito, and that was the day she discovered she was pregnant, and it's just bizarre. A few days later, they celebrated, and the sock puppet was extremely specific. We celebrated with a roast chicken and drinks. Now, in the 1950s, women didn't know any better than to have a drink when they were pregnant. That's just a fact. And I would imagine that there are a lot of children born with fetal alcohol syndrome unnecessarily because of a lack of awareness. The thing with fetal alcohol syndrome is nobody is sure how much alcohol causes it. It could be as little as a thimbleful. They're not sure at what stage of pregnancy you are the most vulnerable. It's not the sort of thing anyone can do tests on because how are you going to find a, a gestating woman who is going to permit you to experiment on her unborn child? So a lot of this is just guesswork. Point is, we know that now. We know that a thimble full of alcohol at the wrong time of pregnancy can produce a child with fetal alcohol syndrome, which last I checked, and I have to be fair about this, I've been retired for a while, so I haven't checked this in a while. Last I checked, it was the number one preventable cause of developmental disabilities in children. Well, was Nutmeg knowingly drinking when she was pregnant? Or was perhaps there no pregnancy to be concerned with? So I would have to say that one, no. Three miscarriage stories, the sock puppet statement of finding out they were pregnant and then celebrating with a roast chicken, Apparently they eat a lot of roast chicken because he references that all the time. Loads of roast chicken and drinks. It was clear it's in the book. So check it out for yourself. I have to say, for me, none of that hangs together. None of it. The fact that Nutmeg needed a nine-month continuance in the hearing is extremely suggestive and certainly implies that she had said she needed the continuance because she was pregnant. It also suggests that she needed to do something to eliminate the pregnancy when, you know, nine months later there's no baby and just made up a story out of whole cloth. That would be reasonable given the fact that her version, the friend's version as presented in Netflix, the sock puppet's version in Spare are not just not in agreement, they are all mutually exclusive. If one story is correct, the other two are incorrect. Which, which story is correct? Well, I'm going to put forth the fact that none of the three are, that this is just a complete fabrication. And I think the continuance they requested in the trial is the reason behind it. 
let's cast forward to the alleged third pregnancy. Well, the sock puppet says very little about that in Spare, but then again, he said very little about any of the other pregnancies because either he was the most detached and uninterested and expectant father in the history of mankind, uh, which is possible. It's also possible he was too stupid to realize anything was going on around him. You know, not going to walk away from that. Or what can I say? That this is all smoke and mirrors. He does go into detail about the alleged birth of the third of these putative children. Uh, and again, it is just craziness. Uh, he says that the bodyguards went out and got them a lot of food while Nutmeg is in labor, and they ate and ate. He makes it sound like they had a pig out party. They ate and ate. Well, even though it's no longer the good old days, what it was like when I was a young woman, when you were lucky if you got yourself a cup of ice chips, they do allow people to eat now. But do they allow them to pig out on burgers, french fries, tacos? By the way, that's the menu the sock puppet laid out. No, no. When they say you can eat while you are in labor, they mean jello, popsicle, largely liquid foods. They, they will make provisions for women who have been in labor for long periods of time. But you're not getting like a five course meal when you're in labor. There is a reason for this. The reason is if they have to anesthetize the mother. Remember, two epidurals, allegedly, the first um, putative pregnancy. Now, I told you, keep, keep that in mind. Two epidurals, first pregnancy, delivery. So that's part of Nutmeg's alleged maternity history. Two epidurals plus induced labor. Go in the second time. And the odds are higher than they would be ordinarily that they may need to anesthetize her. Geriatric pregnancy, two epidurals on the first putative child. And what? They're going to say, yeah, sure. Just knock yourself out on the fast food? No, no. That would not be medically responsible because, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I should have explained this. When you are anesthetized on a full stomach, there is a chance that you will vomit and you will aspirate the vomitus, you know, and choke. And if the choking is not serious enough, they have to clean out your airways this is a nightmare that nobody wants to go through. Uh, the doctors don't want to go through it. The expectant mother certainly doesn't want to go through it. No one in their right mind would court that danger. It's simply best that you just wait till tomorrow to have your pig out feast. And because there was no reason to believe from the description the sock puppet gives in spare that Nutmeg was in labor for many, many hours. There was no need to be eating like that. Would the hospital have let the bodyguards go out and just get them whatever they wanted? Well, I can't say for sure no, because who knows? Who knows? This is California. California is not like the rest of the world. But ordinarily, that's not what happened. The hospital sends up food from their own cafeteria. That's the way it's done normally. They don't like the idea of bringing in outside food under any circumstances and are usually pretty resistant to it. 
there is nothing I can find in any of the contemporary literature, and I've looked, that indicates it's acceptable to allow a pregnant woman to just gorge herself on junk food. So, given the fact that that's about all we really have with regard to this second alleged live birth, sorry, not convincing. All I can do is look at this and ask myself if, in fact, this is just another fabrication. So I have gone from my original position of saying I believe about 60% that Nutmeg actually was pregnant, had a baby, patted her belly. I was very clear about that. I thought that was a given. She was patting the belly. And I was only about 40% convinced that surrogates were involved. Here's the thing. I still believe there's only a 40% chance that surrogates were involved. And even though, so here's the catch. I no longer believe that there's a 60% chance that Nutmeg was actually pregnant with any of these alleged children. I believe there is about a 30% chance that Nutmeg was pregnant with any, any one of these children. I also believe there is a 30% chance something else entirely is going on. I look at this now, and surrogacy is looking a lot less likely to me than simply going off and picking up a child somewhere. I don't know where the, the children they have been photographing come from. I don't know if they're theirs. I don't know if they belong to the neighbors. I don't know if they belong to a, a theatrical talent agency where you can rent a baby for an afternoon. No idea. I am, in fact, prepared to say at this point, I do not believe a single word either Nutmeg or the Sock Puppet have said with regard to any of those three pregnancies. They've lied too much. Too many of the things they have said, as Judge Judy would say, if it doesn't make sense, it's because it's not true. There you go. Uh, the evidence is all right in front of us. The most telling evidence for me, as I said before, is the evidence of the sock puppets rendition of events in his memoir. It doesn't make sense in any case. It just doesn't make any sense. It sounds utterly fabricated. The, the stories tend to conflict with other stories that have been put out as fact. And internally, it's not even consistent. And the sock puppet stories don't even agree with his other stories. Do I believe this? No. No, I don't. Am I 100% convinced? No, no. I won't go that far. I am pretty much 100% convinced Nutmeg was patting her belly. Uh, we know for a fact that photographs of her with Harry with the pregnant belly for the alleged third pregnancy we know those photographs were doctored. We know that. There's a tree in the background that wasn't in the real background. And one bit of doctoring opens the door for all the other bits of doctoring to follow. The problem that Nutmeg and Ginger have is zero credibility. They simply lie about everything all the freaking time. And when you lie like that, nobody ever believes what you say. That was the, the moral of the story, The Boy That Cried Wolf. That you know, if you just scream at the top of your lungs all the time, sooner or later people will just say, 
I don't believe you. So we're going to have to go back to Piers Morgan on this one. I wouldn't believe her if she read the weather report. Uh, I do feel that there's more to the story that has not seeped out into uh, the public domain yet. Uh, one of the interesting things, I'm just going to throw this out and make of it what you will. This is a quote from Revenge by Tom Bowers. Two days after Archie's birth, CBS's Gail King was in Windsor for his first public appearance. BBC and ITV cameras were specifically excluded. At King's request, Meghan timed the photo call in St. George's Hall in Windsor Castle with the start of CBS's morning show in New York. The photograph released by the palace showed the Queen, Prince Philip, Doria, and the Sussexes staring at a shawl. Neither CBS nor the single photographer present were allowed to record Archie's face. And there is a footnote on one of those sentences, and that is Daily Mail, May 19th, 2019. Uh, the text in brackets is simply there for clarity. That's, that was not directly quoted from Tom Bauer's book. Just there so you know what it means. They were staring at a shawl. Make of that what you will. It definitely suggests to me that either Tom Bauer or one of his sources at the Daily Mail knows a lot more about this than anyone is telling. There was one single photographer, and it has been alleged by many that this photograph is completely photoshopped. So, is that what Bauer was getting at? I don't know. No idea. But I'm throwing that out because that is one sort of unanswered riddle. It would have been a bizarre turn of phrase for Bauer to use if he didn't intend for us to pick up on this and run with it. So, all right. That's, I've already gone well over time, so we're going to have to break off now. I will take a look at this, especially as I go through editing and see what I have to cut out for the sake of, of timeliness. And we may revisit this, but I want to leave you with this parting thought. The Mexican community is comprised of different people from all over the world. Very few of us know one another in person. Most of us are not in regular correspondence with one another. And we are all coming up with, I think, very much the same conclusions. We're coming at them from different perspectives, different points of view, different methodologies, but we're all hitting the same place in the end. I think this is one of the best examples out there of the old saying, where there's smoke, there's fire, and an awful lot of us are smelling the smoke. So let's take a look at a slideshow on the way out, um, and because I want to get away from all of this stuff about questionable babies, let's take a look at the late queen when she was young. All right, I'll see you all next time. Meanwhile, have a terrific day.